thank you very much for giving me the, the opportunity. So I'm extremely happy to be able to talk. Well, I'm extremely happy that there's a session on olfaction here um, because this is still a bit of a fringe topic, especially in robotics. But, um, well, me and Achim later will hopefully show you that this is probably not justified and we should, well, well just look at our results. <laughs> okay, so uh, I hope everybody can see me well. Otherwise, just shout. Um, yeah. So, yep, here we go. Um, so, when we talk about olfaction in robots, um, the question arises like, uh, for example, where is a gas source, right? So we want to navigate to a gas source. In biology, this problem is, well, animals face this problem when they locate food sources um, uh, or want to locate mating partners or avoid predators, right? In technology, we're looking at gas-based navigation, for example, the robot locate, locating the source of a gas leak or environmental monitoring, right? So naively, one would say, well, that's very easy. In order to find the gas source, we just like move up an ice concentration gradient that develops when we release a gas at the point source. You know? This is this is motivated by the uh, concept of diffusion, right? So um, you have um, you, you sort of you release a gas at a point, and then it sort of diffuses, and you have a nice gradient over time, right? Problem with this assumption is. The, well, the concentration at distance d first depends on the concentration at the source, right? So you can't estimate the concentration or well, the distance of the source, right? You could probably navigate towards it, but you can't estimate the distance. And it's only absence, abs valid in the absence of air movement and turbulence. And this is totally not realistic because in any natural environment, we have turbulence, right? The turbulence can be caused by wind, obviously, in open environments and the weather. Or draft, if you have a partially closed environment, um, you usually have a draft, at least when there's some gradient of temperature or wind pressure outside. Then uh, buoyancy through a temperature gradient, right? You have buoyancy inside a room and convection that creates turbulence. Then, of course, there's things and animals moving around in the room, uh, steering the air. Okay. So, um, yeah, concentration gradients are destroyed by turbulent airflow. So in natural environments, in any interesting environments, we cannot use concentration gradients for navigation. Right, so what is it then? Well, if you look at intermittency versus distance in the wind tunnel, um, it becomes obvious that this is actually a much more salient feature. And that have, there has been tons of research, mainly in the late 17th, more in the early 80s even, uh, mainly by meteorologists, so people looking at the weather, trying to understand what turbulence does on a large scale. And then later it has been picked up 20 years ago also by neuroscientists who were interested, like, um, for example, moths who, who navigate on olfaction for mate finding over miles, really, how they find their, uh, well, their target, right? And when you look at what the, like, time scale of odor concentration is, this is what is in this, this um, plot here, Right, so close to the source, it's very spiky and lots of stuff is going on. And uh, of course the concentration is high, the average concentration is, well, where is it actually the average concentration? Hard to say because the variance is so high, right? And if you go further away, the maximum concentration goes down a little. But what, what, what is much more striking is actually that the intermittency changes, right? So further away from the source, we have many periods where we have no odor at all and then spikes again in, in the order, right? And then no order in the door, right? So the intermittency is what encodes distance to the source much stronger than any concentration gradient. All right, uh, in the meantime, uh, neuroscience has also caught up, right? Since a couple of years, um, there are papers coming out from various groups across the globe um, in insects, also in mammals, studying olfaction as a temporal sense, right? Going away from this sort of assumption that olfaction is always slow and, uh, I mean, either you, you smell something or you don't, right? Into like looking at olfaction as a temporal sense where the percept evolves over time and it's actually, I mean, it is never constant, right? Um, that's the thing about olfaction, right? So there's a paradigm shift going on there. And we had um, um, a symposium at the annual meeting of the European Chemo Reception Research Organization um, last year, 
where we actually spoke about this. All right. Well, um, the work I'm going to talk about, well, the first part at least, this has been collaborative, collaborative work with Ramon Huerta, who is now with Amazon. He was uh, previously at the Biosurgeons Institute at UC San Diego and Victor Barr at Biouniversität Berlin. So, um, well, we use a data set that has been recorded by Ramon in a wind tunnel, right? This is a wind tunnel and we have gas source or gas sensors, like Eno sports. These are these Eno sports that we have. Um, and they, they are located at various distances uh, from, the, from the board. Um, so, yeah, this has been published by Gara et al. 2013. This is one of the best or and also what most widely used odorant data sets, really, right? It's a public data set and it's, uh, it's quite large, right? So it's really a rich data set. Now, uh, what we see when we look at the data is that um, close to the source, this is what we get, right? Here, gas gets released. Then we have like uh, all the signal increases. So the gas sensor is registering a gas. And then there's this fluctuation here, right? That's going on. And this is due to turbulence in the like fluctuations in the concentration due to turbulent mixing with clean air, right? Then the gas source is shut off again and the uh, signal goes down to the baseline. Okay, so if we go further away from the source, what is striking as well, the overall amplitude goes down, right? So the mean concentration does change. However, what also is apparent, at least it looks like the speed of these fluctuations seems to change. Well, at least that's what I thought when I looked at it. And um, so we did a more systematic exploration then, where we, well, first naive approach was uh, we did a bandpass, you obtain the interesting part of the signal, spl splitting away this low sort of transients where they, which are due to gas onset and offset and some high frequency electronic noise, leaving only that part of the signal that we think is due to turbulent mixing. Okay. Now what you can then do is simply do, a, um, well, what we did is actually a bandpass filter that is inspired by the, um, well, by adaptive olfactory sensing neurons, right? So we used a three stage filtering, a low pass filter that mimics, um, well, a low pass and then differential that mimics the receptor machinery and the lead key integration with an exponential that, mim that mimics a neuronal membrane, right? This all amounts to a bandpass filter with a slightly funny phase response, right? It's in essence a bandpass filter. And then what we did, we looked at signal portions that have continuously rising slope, right? So these portions here in red, this is where the um, derivative is constantly positive, right? Portions of the signal uh, that are monotonously rising. Right? And we call them bouts, right? So that's a bout. We think this is when the sensor is exposed to a plume filament, right? So when one of these uh, plume filaments drifts across the sensor. Now, um, strikingly, by simply counting these bouts, we get a very good estimate of the source distance, right? So further away from the source, we have fewer bouts. Close to the source, we have lots of bouts. And the regression is really, uh, with comparably low error, gives us a good estimate of how far that sensor is away from the, from the, um, the source, right? Okay, um, another thing that's interesting is, well, that the wind tunnel here, that, that's a sketch of the wind tunnel again, it has not just sensors downwind from the source, they are also positioned crosswind from the source, right? So we can look at the signal statistics at the bout statistics uh, across the, um, the wind tunnel. Now, if we look at, the, for example, the number of bouts, we get most bouts at board five, in different shades of gray. These are different, um, different uh, distances, right? So, uh, well, that's not so interesting. It sort of the plume is getting wider as we go uh, further downstream, but the effect is rather weak. Now, what's more interesting is the standard deviation of the bouts, right? This actually goes up towards the edge of that plume, right? And if we divide it by the, by the average number, it, it gets even stronger, right? So close to the source, we have very little variation over, over the number at, at the like, center line. But as we go to the, to the sides, we get, uh, we get more. Guys, can you actually hear me? I have no feedback at all from anyone. Yeah, yeah. I can hear Love you. Love and clear, yeah. 
<laughs> it's so strange giving this talk online. I'm totally not used to it. Okay, thanks. That's good. So I'm not, not just talking to myself. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so uh, what this means is we have, when we look at the variance of these bouts, we can estimate how far crosswind we are from the source, right? Now, this gives us a, um, a two dimensional indication of where we are, right? So we have the gas source here. The average bout count gives us the downwind distance. Whereas the variance of the bout count gives us the crosswind position. Right? So this gives us, well, this could give rise to a robotic navigation strategy. A robot just takes these two, extracts these two features from a measurement and then navigates to the gas source. Right? Now, um, that's of course possible and that's on our agenda, but actually we tried something much simpler first, which is uh, event-based olfaction. Now this is work uh, led by Damien Driggs in my group. So Damien has built a sensor board that is slightly different from those used before, mainly by using much higher uh, dynamic range um, by, by doing some tricks with the arrangement of the processing electronics and the uh, sensors and also using a higher bandwidth ABC. Um, some nifty signal processing and then we applied event-based absolute dead band sampling. Essentially, the algorithm everybody was talking about today. Uh, so where you just, where you turn a signal into a series of events by, by a repeated threshold crossing, right? And we also employed the spinnaker neuromorphic hardware to do some computation. More on that in a second, right? So what we have here is a, set, is a setup. We have a stereo Eno. So these are two sensor boards hooked up to a microcontroller. This is a teensy, so fairly low power actually. And um, now uh, I hope the video works. Um, although you probably don't get the sound. Uh, let me check if I can sort of make it work for you. Um, does, this, does this work? Video works, but the sound not. So I think well, you have to enable sound. If yeah, it's, it's um, never mind. It's it's not so important. What you should be hearing is uh, there are spikes, right? So, um, um, no, nothing happens. Well, what what we did is simply we applied event-based encoding to the odorant uh, to the signal, and then we get spikes. And what you see here on the monitor, this is actually well, it's hard to see. I should have prepared a better figure. This is a, the time lag between the left and the right sensors, right? So we have now much better versions of that figure, but I still have kept that video because I think it has a, its own quality. Okay, oh, there it comes again. Oh, we have already seen that. Okay, here comes a slightly better figure. So what we can do is event-based direction detection. Um, we have the trace. Well, this is the original signal from the uh, sensor on the right. And this is the original signal from the sensor on the left. And these are event-based, well, these are spikes generated by both signals. And you can clearly see, although the lag is really tiny, I mean, it's just a couple of centimeters that these sensors are apart in, in the air stream. And still we can detect, well, in the onset, clearly the time lag between those, right? Um, and actually we took this to Capocaccia, to the Capocaccia workshop in neuromorphic cognition. Uh, Last year, when we were still allow, allowed to have one, unfortunately this year there was none due to uh, COVID-19. But last year, well, we um, took it there as a project and teamed up with a few people, um, most importantly, Torben Schöpfe from uh, out of uh, Bielefeld University. And he came up with a direction decoding network um, that he was working on anyway. This was actually based on work by Moritz Milde and others. Um, with the spiking elementary motion detector neurons, right? So we hooked this up to that, to those spikes, and we could actually do direction detection um, pretty robustly uh, in Capocaccia. And we won the best Neurotech prize, or we won the, we won the Neurotech prize for the best demo, right? Um, that was quite a happy time for everybody involved. Now, uh, what we've done since then is we've put the, um, the stereo enos on a robotic platform. So this is an omnidirectional robotic platform. There's a spinner board here. This is where the spiking um, motion detection network is running on. Um, well, apart from that, there's not much on there. There's a, um, I think there's a Raspberry Pi still on there for, for control um, to sort of do some robot control, but it's, it's not doing lots of 
uh, computation. Anyway, so we do event-based direction decoding um, on Spinnaker. And then we have an event-driven reactive odor search algorithm, which is really super simple, right? So it's simply, if we detect the odor coming from the left, we turn a bit to the left and we move forward for a bit, right? And then uh, the other way, uh, if the odor is from, coming from the right, right? So um, we tested this in the experiment. And uh, again, there's no sound, but uh, what happens so this is the robot, is it's exposed to a puffed odor source. So somebody is eject, injecting odor into the airstream. And I'm speeding this up here a little, so you can see, so that's what it does, right? And finally, sorry for the bad quality, finally it, it locates the odor source, right? That's the fan, it was Damien actually releasing the, releasing the odor source. So that works well. This very simple uh, navigation algorithm works at least in this very simple setup. That was um, quite good to see. Well, another nice thing, a nice observation is that this trajectory, right? This is a sketch of the trajectory. This looks a bit like the typical casting and surging trace that is also observed in insects, namely moths, when they try to localize an odor source. They do the same strategy, right? So the first they cast in a crosswind fashion, and then once they have a good track of this of the odor, they surge upwind, right? So that's just behavior that emerged from this very simple algorithm. Okay, so what's next? Uh, we have a stereo enos, uh, we have a spinnaker -like board where we uh, do um, spiking uh, sort of analysis, analysis networks on. We have an omnidirectional robot that we can sort of uh, do experiments with. We have this knowledge about like what plumes, what the temple structure of olfactory uh, encounters tells us about the uh, structure of the olfactory space. Now, um, yeah, what's what's up with that? Well, we are going to do experiments that uh, explore various uh, navigation strategies, not just the simple ones, in order to um, explore robot navigation, event-based uh, robot navigation in event-based uh, with event-based olfaction. All right. Uh, before I finish, we are currently hiring, so I have an advert out for a dual award PhD student. That is a stu PhD student that gets a PhD from uh, Sydney and from the University of Hertfordshire. This is collaboration with Andrew van Schaik. And there's something coming soon for a postdoc, so if you're interested, please contact me uh, and we can have a chat. All right, thank you. Thank you for all the funders uh, and thanks for your attention. Cheers. Thank you very much. Um... So I don't know if there are any questions. I don't see. Uh, yeah, maybe. Can you explain a bit about the conditioning of the sensors? Does it have saturation or like uh, working time, I guess, and delay in the response? Uh, well, yes, well, the sensors, they are actually quite, the sensors are quite crappy, actually. That's the problem with gas sensing, right? So gas sensors, at least those that you can afford, these are metal oxide sensors, right? The way they operate is they heat up an electrode that is coated with a certain material and volatiles and interact with this material and change the resistance of that electrode. It's a semiconductor electrode, mm -hmm. right? So there's some chemical stuff going on and you need, um, well, the problem with those sensors is that the recovery time is very slow, right? So you can see here, for example, there was a short odor pulse here at five seconds. It took some time for it to travel from the site of release to the odor, right? Then we detect an onset quite quickly, but although the pulse is already over, there's this huge trailing recovery time, which is due to the volatile still sort of sticking on the surface of the sensor, right? And that's the main problem. That is why olfactory sensing has always been thought to be very slow. But actually, I mean, we don't need all this recovery, right? We, we just want the onset. And that's what we do with the event-based coding here. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, and, and the other thing is, of course, if you have this long recovery, you have other pulses sort of sitting on top of this long recovery. And then you get all kinds of problems like, uh, well, not necessarily saturation, although that might occur at some point, um, but you run into the limits of your electronics, right? So if you, you need really like high, well, bit depth ADCs in order to resolve then uh, bouts on top of the recovery phase, right? And both of these problems we mitigate, well, one with event-based uh, processing and the other by doing some uh, 
metrics to the electronics. Mm -hmm. So apparently people were really listening. Uh, we have more questions here. What is the potential of miniaturizing this system? Oh, there's a huge potential, of course, because, um, well, let me see, there's the emails. Uh, the sensor board, well, it is, um, well, the sensors are currently the, the biggest part of it. Of course, if we could miniaturize this, uh, it would be much better. It would probably use less power because each of these sensors here has a hot plate in there that draws like 200 milliwatts, right? That's a problem, especially when you operate it on a reduced like power budget, like your mobile robotics. Um, there are smaller sensors available than those, but of course, like having a really small sensor that uses very little power would be much better, of course, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, another question, how much statistics do you have about the gas source localization experiments? Um, well, we did run a series of experiments, well, several series of experiments. We do have a, a number of, um, sort of recordings and statistics. And I mean, this is all unpub unpublished stuff, right? So we're writing it up at the moment and uh, we expect the preprint to be available in a couple of days until, well, probably weeks rather, right? But we're actively working on it. So, um, and there you'll have the full data. So we're planning to, to publish also the sensor board and, um, and the data along with. with I'm, I'm jumping one question, I'll come back to it later because there is another one which is sort yeah. of related to this. Can you reproduce easily the experiments and the trajectories? Sorry, which, which experiments? The, I guess the uh, chemotax or like the source, source, source seeking. So it's, it's mm. re reproducible, like you can, if you run twice the same experiment, you get roughly the same trajectories, I guess that's well, reproducing uh, experiments where a, a strong element of randomness is involved is of course always difficult, right? Mm -hmm. Because turbulence, it's essentially stochastic. Well, it's quasi stochastic, right? Uh -huh. um, so it's, unless you, con you have some means of controlling uh, the, the well, air dynamics of your room, then uh, it's, well, yeah, it's, it's pretty difficult. It's yeah. Difficult to really closely reproduce it. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's simply also where we're hitting the limit of our means at the moment, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, someone with a better lab could probably do it, and we're happy to collaborate, right? If you know someone with a lab, well, actually, yeah, mm -hmm. then uh, yes, let's talk about right. it. Right. So another question is, what is the sampling rate of uh, the most gas sensors? I think at the moment we're sampling it at something around 180 hertz. Right? So you could go faster if you had like um, um, a faster ABC essentially, right? Because these are, these are resistive uh, sensors and they are huge. So they have very low noise and you can sample them as often as you like really. Right? Mm -hmm. It depends on the electronics. Yeah, another question is, are the big differences between poles and non pole sources? Oh, um, well, we haven't done experiments with non-pulsed sources because we are still like, uh, you know, this is pretty much all pretty recent uh, research. Um, although the data that we used in the wind tunnel experiments, well, in the wind tunnel analysis, right, what I talked about earlier, let me see if I can, um, yeah, so that data here, this is all unpulsed, right? This is essentially one pulse that is very long. Look at the time scale. It's like, well, two, three minutes long, right? One huge pulse of water. And here you have these turbulence involved, uh, turbulence evoked uh, fluctuations, right? So in theory, I think it should be possible to do it with an unpulsed odor because the pulsing occurs anyway as a consequence of turbulent mixing, right? And turbulent Turbulence uh, happens sort of it mixes clean, clean air with odorants and then you have automatically you have pulses of odorants, right? But the experiment is still an experiment that we have to do. Yes. Okay, last question so far. Is it sensitive enough for outdoor use in field, field applications? Oof, uh, well, that's, a, <laughs> that's again the question. Well, so we have used, we have tried to send us outdoors we have not tried any uh, navigation outdoors yet. Uh, that's clearly something to try, but of course outdoors, we have even more 
uh, sort of parameters that you really can't control, like temperature, like wind direction, wind strength, and all these things you really cannot control. You can't even see where your where your gas is going, right? So you're flying blindly, right? Mm -hmm. It's extremely interesting, and I'd like to see what happens. But I think, from a scientific standpoint, uh, one would have to think a lot how to make meaningful results out of outdoor experiments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, uh, yeah, there's a, a, a not comment there, but um, just it, that, uh, that this is a personal question. So regarding to, I mean, re regarding to the uh, miniaturization of the system, um, there was a paper published on how humans uh, can track others when they, they use the two nostrils. Like if, if you yes. block one of them, then mm -hmm. the, the tracking is less accurate. Um, and depending on like uh, depending to who you who you ask, they might say, well, you know, it's not really um, not really possible that humans use both nostrils because they are too close to each other. So, in terms of miniaturization, uh, like how far do you think it can be? I mean, first of all, do you think that is is, is published? Uh, but like, what's your opinion about that? So. Um... Why should it not be possible? I mean, it's simply a function of distance between the two, like sampling, between the points where you sample and the time resolution of your, of your sensory system, right? And mm -hmm. we know that humans, well, we are like, we are different from insects in that we, we are sniffing, right? All mammals have this sniffing thing going on. And nevertheless, when we sniff, we could still detect a time lag between both nostrils. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a bit of a dispute, but I found the original results quite convincing with an laser prism that was done by Noam Sobel's group, right? So um, I think it, it could be possible, right? Why not? Why not? Why shouldn't it be, it be possible? Because we know that uh, human auditory ne sensory neurons, they do respond quite quickly to transients of odorants, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and, and with this distance, like a couple of hundred milliseconds is really enough. Also, like uh, what should be considered with the two nostril experiment, it's an experiment where people were sniffing in close proximity to the floor, to the soil, right? In, in uh, they were sniffing yeah. like on a lawn, and mm -hmm. there, of course, gradient plays a different role, right? Because you're not that's not turbulent mixing there. That's really like you're sampling from two points which are like a centimeter uh, apart within sort of the grass layer. That's all. <laughs> that's what they did in this experiment. Yeah, right? yeah. And there's probably uh, the, the gradient plays a role there because mm -hmm. there's not so much of a mixing going on. Okay. Okay, so I think there are no more questions. I don't see the Slack channel. Awesome. So thank you very much for your really interesting talk. It was a pleasure.